Our guest speaker for today is known by most people as Dr. Lisa Beardsley Hardy, Director of Education for the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventist, but she's known to my kids as Grandma Lisa. And that's why she's here today, because the elementary school just had their Grandparents' Day celebration, and as all of our kids did, they sent invitations to their grandparents, and Grandpa and Grandma Lisa said, okay, we'll come. They came from Maryland here for that. But when I found out they were coming, I said, well, maybe it would be a good idea if you shared with, with our church about Seventh-day Adventist education around the world and what's happening. And um, from, from a biblical perspective, normally when they come to visit, it's at the holiday season. There's so many things going on that we, could, you know, we can't throw that in. It is unfortunate that our academy is on, on leave right now because we would love to have them be able to be here. But that's the way it worked out. So um, she is British by birth and of Finnish and Japanese ancestry. And she is a citizen of both Finland and the United States and has a house in both places. Um, she was elected this last summer to her third term as a director of education for General Conference. She worked as an associate director for a term before that. Also is the chair of the board for the Adventist Accrediting Association. We have an accrediting association that, although most of our schools are regionally accredited as well, our Adventist Accrediting Association makes sure that across the world, the standards of education reflect our values and, and the high level of education we try to bring. So, um, so she's also the chair of that travels a lot. We're always getting pictures saying, I'm in this place, I'm in that place, I'm in the other place. And um, as she tries to give guidance and direction and encouragement to the various uh, educational institutions around our world. I'm sure she'll share some about how that's been affected by the pandemic and so on. But uh, please welcome uh, Lisa Beardsley Hardy. Can I pray with you before we... Start. Dear Father in heaven, I want to lift up Lisa as she shares your word today. Fill her with your Holy Spirit. Let the words that we hear not be hers, but be yours and be inspiring for the calling that you have given us in evangelism through education. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, thank you for that introduction. On behalf of the General Conference, Worldwide Education Work, I bring you warm greetings. Greetings from Elder Ted Wilson, and also from Dr. Arnie Nielsen, who's the Vice President of Education for the North American Division. He knows about this school. When I said I was coming here for Grandparents' Day, he said, that is a great school. It's a growing school. So he asked me to send you special greetings. I also congratulate and thank this church for what you are doing to support the Ministry of Education. One third of your budget, that's a significant investment, and you're investing in eternity. I don't know if some of you have been looking at your, your, retire, your IRA, IRAs and your, your Roth accounts and so on. They're not doing so well, but I tell you, when you invest in education, you are going to get great returns, already now and even greater returns in eternity. I would also like to congratulate and thank Highland Elementary School. It was wonderful to be there and the Academy. Special recognition and thanks to the principal, to Principal Chad Watkins and Principal Melissa Shoemaker. I get the newsletter. It's nice to see the school. Yesterday we visited the classrooms of Mr. Russell and Mrs. Drusky and I could see just what a rich and inviting learning environment the teachers are providing. I thank and salute all of the teachers for what you are doing. Hats off to the teachers at Highland Elementary School and Academy. Thank you. Let us turn to our scripture for today, and that is in all four Gospels. You heard it read from the Gospel of John. It's also in Matthew 14, 13 to 21, Mark 6, 31 to 44, Luke 9, 12 to 17, and John 6. 
And although there are minor differences from gospel to gospel, each one giving us a slightly different perspective, the core elements of all of those are the same. The setting is that Jesus and his disciples have just returned from a tremendous launch of the ministry. Jesus had commissioned the 12, told them what they were to do, given them power, and they came back with what they had accomplished. Demons had been cast out. People had been healed. The gospel of the kingdom had been proclaimed. And they, above all, were astounded at what had happened. And as they were coming back, they received devastating news. John the Baptist, who had commissioned and foretold the ministry of Christ, had just been beheaded. So here they were up on the mountaintop with this great triumph, and then cast down to the depths on the news of John the Baptist being beheaded. There were questions. What next? Is Jesus going to be next? Uh, what about them? What did this mean? John the Baptist had foretold this mission, launched it, and now it had ended. So Jesus planned a retreat, and our daughter Heather's at a retreat this weekend, a women's retreat, a time to get away. So she's not here with us. She's uh, singing and playing her violin there at the retreat. Jesus called them aside for a retreat to get some rest, some physical rest, but also just to regroup after what had just happened from this mountain top experience to John the Baptist being beheaded. Just when things were looking so promising. But before they could get to the retreat location, people saw where they were going and they got there ahead of them, either on foot or by boat to a remote location. We don't know exactly how many people were there, but uh, we read from the Gospels that there were at least 5,000 men, and there were also more children and women. And we know at least it was one boy, because he features in the, the account in Matthew. They came to hear Jesus preach, and they also came for healing, and they too were looking for answers. The word had been out about John the Baptist being beheaded. Now the exact location where they went to is unclear. I always thought that it was over, over on the eastern side of the lake. That's across the lake. That's the point of the, the modern day Golan Heights. But as I read, archeologists debate whether it was up in the northwest or what was in southwest. We don't know the exact location. There are shrines and old pilgrimages uh, sites at both of those northwest and southwest locations. We don't know the exact location, but we do know that it was remote. It was a place of solitude. We know that there weren't any inns out there. There were no places for them to buy food. So it was a, it was a remote place. Now let's turn to John 6. John 6, the Gospel of John 6, verses 5 to 9. This wasn't in the reading. This is a little bit earlier. John 6. 5 to 9, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test them, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to even have bread a bite. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Let us consider first this little boy and his lunch. The lesson here, the first lesson from the scripture is that Christ uses who we are and what we have in order to bless others. If we only have five little buns, and barley in the hierarchy of grains is at the bottom. There's 
wheat and corn, but barley is a rough grain and barley bread is, is a coarse bread. It's not that great. So this little boy was probably from a poor family having barley buns. But if we only have five little barley buns and two small fish, that's enough. He can use it. If you are just a boy and not a man, that's enough for Christ. He can use that when you bring it to him. He accepts who you are and what you have to offer him. And he can turn that little into much. When we look at the outside, we look at capacity, but Christ looks at the heart and he transforms that little into much to be a blessing. In my work as director of education, I have seen many examples of how God takes just a little bit and turns it into much. Just two examples. Adventist schools are growing in South America, and I just talked with Ana Maria, who comes from Argentina originally. I don't know where you're sitting now. There you are. I just returned from Argentina, River Plate University, a fine university, to inaugurate their brand new dental school, a multi-story, three building high, three-story high school. In fact, I should tell you, Ana Maria, I didn't tell you when I was there. Seven years ago, when we went to the school to evaluate them and they said they wanted to start a dental school. They took us to the medical school up to the, the, the uh, second floor of that and they opened a window and they said, look out the window. And we looked out the window and they had taken a bag of flour and they had traced out with the flour, sprinkled out the line of a building on the grass. And so we we're all standing, we looked out at this white square, hollow square out in the grass and they said, that is going to be our dental school. I remember peeking out thinking, that is going to be a dental school. And in fact, now I had the pleasure of inaugurating that three-story beautiful dental school, and I was there a few weeks ago. Education is just growing leaps and bounds in South America because people recognize and value the quality of Adventist education. Now, on the other side of the world, in Africa, there's also a desire for education. Dr. Andrew Mutero, and you heard about him this morning in the children's story, his father was James. Dr. Andrew Mutero has a vision for the power of Adventist education to transform lives because he saw it in his own family and he's seen it multiplied over and over again. And he knew about the great work they're doing in South America. So he communicated with Edgar Luz, who's the education director there, and he said, can I bring a group of conference and union presidents and treasurers and some educators with me to South America to see what you're doing? He arranged a study tour, and they spent 10 days in Brazil. They went to Brasilia, they went to Sao Paulo, they looked at the models. They have a set plan, a blueprint for schools and they just replicate this model over and over again. They, he took them to the publishing house and he saw how the publishing house is working together with the schools to develop a whole series of textbooks and learning resources and, and uh, computer-based resources. And the educators, and of course the educators were inspired, but the conference and union presidents, the treasurers left with a vision that they did not have before they visited the schools in South America. They went back, and then we had a conference for all three divisions in Africa, South Africa, Indian Ocean Division, the East Central Africa Division, where Dr. Mutero is, and West Central Africa Division. And we spent four days together, we included the treasurers with us, the union and conference treasurers. In fact, one educator said, now we can have a real conversation if the treasurers are here with us in these meetings. It takes resources to make a vision come true. And after that meeting, Dr. Rudatinya Mwangachuchu returned to his home in the Democratic Republic of Congo. He was so inspired. He uh, recalled the words of the South American Division President, who's now the General Conference Secretary, Ayrton Keller, who tell them, we don't have schools, rather we have churches 
in the shape of schools. He affirmed the evangelistic role of schools in South America that is driving church growth. So Dr. Mwanga Chuchu went back to the Northeast Congo Union Mission on the Lake of Kibu in a city called Goma. The Union, the conference compound is there in the city, next to it is a church, but there was a, uh, a house next to the Union compound, the conference compound, and he purchased that. He took down the house and he said, I am going to build a school. Then he rounded up five children, and the parents of five children said, we're going to start a school right here. The children came to school, and he said that first day after their mothers left, there was some whimpering and crying, and the children wanted to go home, but the teachers just took those children, and in that part of the, country, uh, of the world, mothers have this long cloth, and they bundle the children in the cloth on their back. So the teachers just continued about their activities. They picked up the whimpering ones, tied them on the back, and then went about their teaching activities. And pretty soon, the whimpers settled down, the crying stopped, the sobbing stopped. Children were ready to get down on the ground and start learning. The next week, when some of the mothers said, okay, you don't have to go to school anymore, uh, Pastor Mwanga Chuchu said, the children said, no, no, we have to go to school. And today, three years later, there are 480 children in this school, and they're building a three-story building. And I spoke with Pastor Manga Chuchu at general conference session. I said, how's your school going? He said, we are going to have 1,000 students before long, going from no children to five whimpering children to 480 with a vision for 1,000 children. And it's not just those children, it's all of those parents that come along who are now exposed to the gospel in a way that they could not have otherwise. The next one that I'd like to tell you about <coughs> is on the opposite side of the world, in the Euro-Asia division, where Vladimir Tachuk was the education director. And they had a vision for opening 50 new schools and 50 training centers between 2015 and 2020. This division is based in Moscow. It covers 13 time zones all the way towards Japan. And <clears throat> then something happened that was really uh, God's leading. The education director was elected to become the division treasurer. Now you're hearing the same theme again. What a happy occasion it is when the education director becomes the division treasurer. Now there was resources to put under this dream of building schools, and this is what they did. I'll give you just a few examples. In the Bukovinskaya conference in Ukraine, the officers of the conference took action to move the conference offices out of the conference building into one of the local churches and transform the conference office into a school. That was in Chern Chernovitsky, Ukraine. They started with 30 children, and very soon it grew to 200 children. In Western Ukraine, they followed suit. They moved the conference out of the conference building into a local church, turned the conference building into a school. They did the same thing in Chisinau in Moldova, remodeled their headquarters, turning it into a school. That was in 2018. And one Ukrainian businessman was so impressed about the evangelistic power of education that he donated his factory and remodeled it into a school. By 2020, the Euro-Asia division had 46 new schools, just a few shy of their goal of 50. And by now, they have opened all 50. Now, you may wonder, what happened to all of these schools since Russia invaded Ukraine? The headquarters was in Moscow. About half of our enrollment was in Ukraine. In the confusion and the mass evacuations across Ukraine in, those, in that first week, one school after another school in Ukraine closed. But 
almost before breath could be taken, those schools were reopened. The pulpits and the chairs were taken out of the classrooms, and in its place were mattresses on the floor. And the teachers started cooking borscht and serving bread to the internally displaced people who had to leave their homes and were moving towards one of the borders, towards Poland, Romania, Moldova. Uh, they would stay mostly women and children and older people because men between the age of 18 and 60, it's martial law now in Ukraine, have to stay in the country. So mostly women, children, and older people started moving, going as far as they could, and then they would sleep in one of our classrooms, eat, and, and uh, get their bearings, and then find the next place they would go to. And so our schools became shelters for internally displaced people. Even our college there, and you've probably never heard of the town before this whole thing happened. We have one college in Ukraine, and it's in a town by the name of Bucha, which is just north of Ukraine. That came under attack very quickly, and the, the administrators, I think I have some administrators here, they prayerfully uh, reflected on what they should do, and they did the right thing. They evacuated all of the students in the first week to the far part of the country. About 240 women and children and elderly people came there to the dormitories to take shelter as internally displaced people, but the troops quickly moved in and our education directors and pastors at risk to their own lives evacuated those people out of the school. And praise the Lord, despite bombs and missiles that literally went and destroyed the, the, the whole of Bucha, right around them. The apartment building across them got a direct missile hit, burnt to the ground. Cluster munitions fell on the property, blew out the windows of our school, of our college there, but there was no structural damage to the school. And we just praised the Lord, and no student life uh, was lost there. And, we praise God for that. Unfortunately, the, the son of the librarian was, was killed, but other than that, everybody was safe on that campus. Right now, two of our schools are, are in occupied regions. They're not operating because they don't want to implement the curriculum that's forced on them, which is a godless curriculum. But 20 of our schools opened on September 1 in Ukraine by the grace of God. So we, we ask for your prayers as you, as you read the news. Think of our schools in Ukraine and our teachers in Ukraine who are teaching face-to-face -face if they can and online if it's unsafe. But 20 of those schools, are, uh, 22 schools are now operating. The experience of the Euro-Asia division and Ukraine is very much like what the disciples experienced. EUD, this uh, Euro-Asia division, had great growth, a great vision for growth. They opened 46 new schools. Everybody was on a high. People were on board. Conference presidents were on board. This Ukrainian factory owner was on board. And then there was this crash of the invasion. And yet, the Lord is in the boat in the storm. He is still guiding affairs for them, and he will do it for you. This is true for our own lives. There are times when we have a great victory, a great success, and then suddenly bad news. News of a health crisis, financial challenges, something in the family that seems to cancel out the success that has just been achieved. But from the scripture, we are reminded that Christ is still in the storm. He's with us, and he is able to guide us to a safe harbor. He will do that for them. He did it for them. He will do it for us. So if you're experiencing a setback or a storm of some kind, look to Christ. The Lord of all creation invites us to walk on the water, and he will guide us to safe harbor. Verse 626 of John points to the final lesson that we will consider today. John 6, 26. 
After the people ate, ate their fill, there were leftovers, and, um, were, and Christ demonstrated his divine powers, which was such an important affirmation at this point in the ministry after John the Baptist had been killed. Their hopes were revived. And here in verse 26, John 6, 26, we see the third lesson that is for them as well as for all of us. John 6 and verse 26. And I'm reading again from the New International Version. Now they find him the next day on the other side of the lake. They don't know how he got there. They know he didn't go in the boat. They saw that. They saw him go up to pray. Uh, it's a long way to walk. They can't figure it out, but they said, Rabbi, how did you get here? And Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Going on to verse 27. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him... God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Christ observes that it is human nature to be materialistic, to focus on the here and now. This tremendous miracle, and they're just thinking about their next meal. Two chapters earlier in John 4, there was a similar conversation that Christ had with the Samaritan woman at the well. He was promising her eternal water, and she's just talking about coming to the well the next day. Completely separate conversations. She's speaking about eternity. She thinks about tomorrow. So typical of humanity. We focus on the here and now rather than the hereafter. And it was the same with these 5,000 men. they just eaten and seen a miracle, an undisputable miracle, and they then quote scripture back to him. It's interesting how we can use scripture to our own purposes. They quote scripture in a way that met their own aspirations. They reminded him of Moses and the manna, and then they said, sir, give us this bread always. Just give us our sandwich for the next day and the next day and the next day. And Jesus bluntly pointed out to him that everybody who ate the manna that Moses gave them had died. And what he was offering was something entirely different. He was offering them eternal life. And despite this astounding offer of eternal life, this is the point where some of the disciples who had been following him turned away. They said, this is a hard message. They didn't. They, they wanted to just focus on the here and now and turned away. There are students at all of our campuses, in all of our schools, even here at Highland Elementary and Highland Academy, who live only for today. And there are parents who make extreme sacrifices and churches like yours who make significant sacrifices so that children can have hope of a better future, have a better life. That reminds me of one school, that one church that I went to, where I was talking to a parent, and a parent was talking about education and the importance of education. And he said, education is our only hope for upward mobility. You'll recall that the sermon title today is Upward Mobility, and in fact, Statistics show that those with an education are more likely to be upwardly mobile. They are more likely to have a better income. That is true. But we can't be satisfied with simple upward mobility in terms of worldly terms. The upward mobility and better up to opportunity that Adventist education offers is what drives so many to attend our schools around the world. And I, I see that. About half of our enrollment are not Adventists, and those that are not Adventists are coming just to give their children a better tomorrow, a better chance of getting a job. They are not thinking of eternity. 
And we're known for our schools, we're known for quality of education, even if the parents and the community don't clearly understand our spiritual purposes. Some of you might know Dr. Newton Hoylett. <clears throat> he was the Vice President for Student Affairs at Andrews University. When he retired, he was invited to pastor a church in Florida, in Lehigh Heights. And so he and his wife moved to Florida and started pastoral ministry after years of educational ministry. He told me when he walked into the church that first Sabbath, he found only 40 people and two children. 40 people and two children in that church. Well, having spent his career in education, he knew the power of education to revitalize church growth. And they didn't have a school, but he thought, I can do Adventist education even without a school. This is what he did. First of all, he started an annual education day. And that education day, the sermon was on education. Then on the evening of Education Day, the church conducted their own graduation ceremony. It was for the children of the church who were in public schools. Some of those children couldn't go to their own graduation because it was on a Sabbath. And so the church had one. And so the kids from whatever school they had, they came and their educational accomplishment, their graduation or moving from one grade to another was acknowledged and recognized and affirmed in Lehigh Adventist Church. Then they had a banquet that evening to honor all of the students and their educational accomplishments graduating from primary, secondary, and tertiary school. Students and parents really appreciated this because they had felt sidelined. There wasn't an Adventist school, their kids were in public school, and they wanted them to be, but they, it just didn't work out. For whatever reason, it didn't work out. And now these children and their parents were, were gathered in to the church. He also asked every young person or their parents to send him their report card. And if they sent them the report card and they had a good GPA, he would issue a, parents, a pastor's honor roll certificate. He just printed it out on his own printer and it said pastor's honor roll. And that was given to each child who had a good GPA. And each church member contributes $5 a month to the church scholarship fund and then they as a church decide who is going to get that church scholarship fund. When I visited them, they gave it to a young lady who was going to go to Oakwood College. When I visited their church, their church had grown from 40 members to 400 members. And they had grown from two children to 132 children, still without a school because he saw Adventist education is not just about a building, it's about the goals of Adventist education. And when I was there, it was a young, energetic, vibrant church. They had a steel drum orchestra that they were sponsoring at that church, and the young people were involved. And they also reached out to the community. They have a back-to-school event where 177 members, when I visited them, 177 members of the community came to the church and they were given a backpack full of school supplies that was, that was just serving the community and also promoting the values of Adventist education. Dr. Hoylett wrote me an email and I'm sharing this with you as a word of encouragement because yes, you have a school, but you also have an influence in this community at large and there are people that you can serve through this church. He says, the effort and passion we expend for educating the children of the church and the community is power packed with exponential rewards. Therefore, do not give up or give in to the natural pains of staying the course. Lehigh Acres Church has now bought the property next to them and their dream is to build a school. They show that you can start with two children and have a vision for Adventist education. 
As we build, though, and I say that for them and any one of us as we build through our offerings, let's not be blinded by what we see. And we saw some beautiful classrooms yesterday. I loved seeing the creativity of the teachers and the, and the children, their artwork on there. But let's not be blinded by just what we see and keep our eye on what is not seen. Our higher goal of eternity let us ever keep the foundation to be Christ and remember that the true building blocks are not made from stone and mortar. The true building blocks are the children of our own homes, our communities, and in our schools. And teachers are key to opening the eyes of the children and their parents. So again, saluting the teachers thanking the teachers. We affirm you in your sacred ministry. And it's not just the teachers. Those who work in the cafeteria, like Heather, our daughter, and those who work on the grounds, you're part of this ministry. We affirm you in that ministry of mentoring young people. Our final word to the parents here, to the grandparents, I speak to us as grandparents, and to members of this church. It's our privilege and it's our duty to point to the mansions of heaven. Adventist education fosters true upward mobility beyond the standards of this world, beyond the coveted positions of this world, and it points to the offices of service in the hereafter. So I thank you and I thank this congregation for what you are doing to urge students to climb to the top of the ladder that rests against the portals of heaven. Let no child be content with just rising one or two rungs. As Paul counseled to the Colossians, and I'll conclude with this scripture, Colossians 3, verse 1 to 4. Colossians 3, 1 to 4. Paul counseled the Colossians saying, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. To summarize, Christ can turn our little into much when we ask him to use it to bless others. Don't become discouraged. Don't become disheartened. If you face a setback, if you experience failure after a great win, Jesus is still in the business of guiding us through troubled waters, guiding us through a storm to safe harbor. And finally, let us all resolve to do what is in our power to affirm true upward mobility higher than the world can offer is the gift of salvation in Christ. Let's keep our eyes on that goal. Let us pray. We offer you our praise, O God, our Father, who has entrusted to us the ministry of reconciliation. And we offer praise to Jesus Christ, who died for us, was raised, and who now sits at the exalted right hand of God in the heavenly realms, above all rule and author, authority, power, and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. All praise and honor be to him. Amen. <laughs>